hey there uh, welcome back to my channel and in this video i am going to discuss the transportation of carbon dioxide i have already made a video on transportation of oxygen in order to understand the transportation of gases with respect to the respiratory system go and have a look at that video also so under the transportation of carbon dioxide we will be discussing some very important concepts like uh, haldane effect chloride shift which is also called as the hamburger phenomenon and we will also discuss the reversal of the chloride shift as such transportation of carbon dioxide if at all it is asked as a separate question can be asked as a short note or transportation of gases as such they can be asked total as the long essay okay overall it's an important topic so stay tuned to this video till the end and understand the concepts behind the transportation of carbon dioxide so let's begin the transportation of carbon dioxide transportation of carbon dioxide occurs in three parts the first portion is diffusion of carbon dioxide into the blood so from where it is diffusing so carbon dioxide as we all know is produced in the cells or in the tissues so from here the carbon dioxide has to enter into the capillaries this is what is called as diffusion of carbon dioxide into the blood so once the carbon dioxide has entered into the capillaries or into the blood it has to be transported that is what is the transportation of carbon dioxide in the blood and once this carbon dioxide is transported and it is going at the level of the lungs it has to be released this is called as the release of carbon dioxide in the lungs so all these three aspects we are going to cover in this video in order to understand the diffusion of the carbon dioxide into the blood we have to know the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in different levels like intracellular partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 46 mmhg interstitial fluid partial pressure is 45 arterial capillary pco2 is 40 venous capillary pco2 is 45 and alveolar air pco2 is 40 mmhg so okay with these differences it is easy for us to understand the diffusion so first let's look at the first step in the transportation of carbon dioxide which is diffusion of carbon dioxide into the blood so how does this occur now as i have already told you let's say this is the tissue okay or these are the cells and how much is the intracellular partial pressure of carbon dioxide it is 46 mmhg in the interstitial space it is 45 mmhg so if this is a capillary this is the arterial end and this is the venous end of the capillary in the arterial end how much is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide it is 40 mmhg okay fine so in the arterial end the pco2 is 40 and in the interstitial fluid the pco2 is 45 mmhg so how much is the difference in the partial pressure well, there is a difference of 5 mmhg so this difference is more than enough for the carbon dioxide to diffuse from the tissues or from the cells into the capillaries and as we know one of the properties of diffusion is that the diffusion keeps on occurring till the equilibrium is reached that means till the partial pressure of this gas is equal on both the sides so the diffusion is going to keep on occurring till the partial pressure of carbon dioxide becomes 45 mmhg so by that time the blood would have travels from the arterial end into the venous end so by the time the blood enters into the venous end the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is going to become 45 mmhg so this small difference of 5 mmhg of partial pressure between the interstitial fluid or between the interstitial space and the arterial end of the capillary is more than enough for the carbon dioxide to diffuse from the tissues into the capillaries so that means in the arterial end the pco2 is 40 mmhg and by the time it enters into the venous and the blood enters into the venous and the pco2 is going to become 45 mmhg so what did i tell you that in the arterial end the pco2 is 40 mmhg so when the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 40 mmhg at that point of time the arterial blood is going to contain 48 ml of carbon dioxide for every 100 ml of blood okay so this is the content of carbon dioxide in the arterial end 
so by the time this blood is going to go to the venous end 4 ml of carbon dioxide for every 100 ml of blood is now going to enter into the capillaries so that means when we add 4 ml how much will be the content of the carbon dioxide by the time the blood is moving into the venous end it is going to become 52 ml of carbon dioxide for every 100 ml of blood so that means 4 ml of CO2 for every 100 ml of blood is going to enter or it is going to diffuse from the tissues into the capillaries. Compare it with oxygen. How much amount of oxygen was entering from the arterial end into the tissues? The amount of oxygen which was entering was 5 ml for every 100 ml of blood. This is a slight difference between the oxygen which is diffusing from the arterial end of the capillary into the tissues and carbon dioxide which is diffusing from the tissues into the arterial end of the capillaries. So now coming to the transportation of the carbon dioxide, remember that carbon dioxide is transported in three forms. The first form is what is called as dissolved form and the amount of carbon dioxide transported in the dissolved form is least accounting to 7% which is equivalent to 0.3 ml of carbon dioxide transported for every 100 ml of blood. The next form is the major form of transportation of carbon dioxide. Okay, This is the major form and this is the bicarbonate form. And in the bicarbonate form, the carbon dioxide which is transported is 70 percentage accounting to 3 ml of carbon dioxide which is transported for every 100 ml. Of. And last is in carb amino form which accounts to 23 percentage of the total carbon dioxide which is transported or which is also equivalent to 0.7 ml of carbon dioxide transported for every 100 ml of blood. So that means there are three methods of transportation of carbon dioxide. First is in dissolved form, second one is in bicarbonate form and the third one is in carb amino form. So let's understand all three of them with the help of this very simple diagram which is given in Guyton. So dissolved form 7% carb amino form 23 percentage and bicarbonate form 70 percentage. So this is the cell, this is the carbon dioxide. What is the partial pressure of carbon dioxide inside the cell? The partial pressure of carbon dioxide inside the cell is 46 mmHg. The partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the interstitial spaces is 45. 5 mmHg because of this the carbon dioxide is going to diffuse into the capillaries. So the carbon dioxide has now diffused inside the capillaries. Now as soon as the carbon dioxide has entered into the capillaries 7 percentage of carbon dioxide is going to dissolve in the plasma. This is how it is transported. 20 percentage of the carbon dioxide is now going to combine with hemoglobin. Now which portion of the hemoglobin does it combine with? It combines with the amine group of the hemoglobin and it results in the formation of what is called as carb amino hemoglobin. Okay, results in the formation of carb amino hemoglobin. Remember that this combination of hemoglobin okay, with carbon dioxide is a very very loose bond. Whenever the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is going to reduce, this bond is going to break away and carbon dioxide is going to release from the hemoglobin. Okay, remember that oxygen which is also binding to the hemoglobin, to which portion of the hemoglobin it is binding? It is, it is binding to the Fe2 plus portion of the heme. Whereas carbon dioxide is binding to the amine portion of the hemoglobin. That's why it is resulting in the formation of carb amino hemoglobin. And the major portion of the carbon dioxide, okay, it is going to combine with the water which is present inside the RBC. 
this reaction is going to take place in the presence of its, this enzyme which is called as carbonic anhydrase and this is going to result in the formation of H2CO3 which is nothing but the carbonic acid. Immediately the carbonic acid is going to dissociate into HCO3- minus and H+. Plus. Now H+, plus is going to be buffered with the hemoglobin it's going to combine with the hemoglobin hemoglobin is acting like a buffer here and the bicarbonate which is formed it is thrown out of the rbc and it enters into the plasma okay in exchange of this bicarbonate now bicarbonate is a negative ion one more negative ion cl minus is going to enter back into the rbc now this process of exchange of bicarbonate with the chloride is going to occur via a exchanger which is situated in the rbc membrane so how does that occur i will show you so what has happened carbon dioxide has entered into the rbc carbon dioxide combines with water in the presence of carbonic anhydrase this results in the formation of h2co3 h2co3 immediately dissociates into h plus and hco3 minus h plus is buffered by the hemoglobin and hco3 minus is thrown out of the rbc and it enters into the plasma now in exchange of the hco3 minus one chloride ion or chloride ion is going to enter inside the rbc so this is going to occur by the presence of this exchanger and this exchanger is called as an ion exchanger okay or it is also called as bicarbonate chloride exchanger okay so this process is what is called as chloride shift or it is also called as hamburger phenomenon remember this so now our carbon dioxide is present in this capillaries in three forms one is in dissolved form one is in combination with hemoglobin in the form of carbaminohemoglobin and the third form is the bicarbonate form now this blood when it enters at the level of the lungs okay at that point of time what is the partial pressure of oxygen partial pressure of oxygen in the capillaries in the arterial end of the capillaries is 40 mmHg remember that pulmonary arteries are going to carry deoxygenated blood that's why the partial pressure of oxygen is 40 mmHg the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 45 mmHg and now this pulmonary capillaries have come very close to the alveoli okay now what is the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli it is 104 mmHg what's the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveoli it is 40 mmHg so now there is a huge diffusion gradient a huge gradient between the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveoli and the partial pressure of oxygen in the arterial end of the pulmonary capillaries see partial pressure of oxygen is 104 mmHg in the alveoli and it is only 40 mmHg in the arterial end of the pulmonary capillaries so because of this huge difference in the partial pressure the oxygen is going to diffuse from the alveoli into the capillaries so as soon as the oxygen enters into the capillaries now here because of high partial pressure of the oxygen this oxygen is going to bind with the hemoglobin so as soon as oxygen binds with the hemoglobin the hemoglobin is going to release the carbon dioxide this is called as haldane effect this is what is called as haldane effect which is exactly opposite to the bohr effect which i discussed when i was discussing the transportation of oxygen so do please watch that video in order to understand as to what is the bohr effect so once the oxygen comes and binds with the hemoglobin now this hemoglobin has released the carbon dioxide that means once oxygen comes and binds with the hemoglobin the affinity of hemoglobin with carbon dioxide has reduced and it has released this carbon dioxide now one more thing what is going to happen is this hemoglobin is also going to release h plus ions because i told you when i was telling you as to what happens to the h plus which is released whenever the carbonic acid dissociates the h plus also goes and binds with the hemoglobin this is because the hemoglobin is acting like a buffer so there is also release of h plus and also release of co2 and there is formation of oxy hemoglobin now this co2 which is formed it is going to come out of the rbc diffuse out of the rbc and it is going to enter into the plasma now this h plus ion which is formed 
this has to be neutralized so in order to neutralize the h plus ion whatever bicarbonate was there in the plasma it is going to enter back into the rbc so once this bicarbonate enters into the rbc in exchange of this bicarbonate chloride has to go out of the rbc and into the plasma this is what is called as reversal of the chloride shift now this h plus ion is neutralized by this hco3 minus so h plus combines with hco3 minus and again it results in the formation of h2co3 now this h2co3 in the presence of again carbonic anhydrase breaks down into water and carbon dioxide now this carbon dioxide is going to get out of the rbc and it is going to enter into the plasma so carbon dioxide dissolved in the plasma is there in the plasma carbon dioxide which was attached to the hemoglobin has come to the plasma and the carbon dioxide which was there in the bicarbonate form has also now come back into the plasma now what is going to happen is that the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is 45 mmhg here in the arterial end of the capillaries and partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveoli is 40 mmhg so because of this difference because partial pressure of co2 is more in the arterial end this carbon dioxide is now going to diffuse and it is going to enter into the alveoli so this is how the transportation of carbon dioxide is going to take place so important things are chloride shift the holden effect and the reversal of the chloride shift if at all you have understood this concept of transportation of carbon dioxide do hit the like button subscribe to my channel and share this video among your friends thanks a lot if at all there are any doubts put the doubts in the comment section below thank you bye bye